Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I will start off with doing something that I don't normally do, which is explain a little bit about my day job. Um, because that is kind of relevant for this presentation. So I work at Cisco Systems Norway and we make video conferencing equipment. Anything from desktop systems to boardrooms. And what makes those interesting is that people want to connect a laptop for a presentation, to show a presentation. Uh, so we see Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, laptops, uh, AMD, NVIDIA, Intel GPUs, uh, HDMI and DisplayPort. So you get a wide, wide variety of video sources that are, that are connected to it. And you can also connect to Google, Chromecast, Apple TV, although the vast majority is presentation sources. Uh, so for those laptops we are a display. We look like a display, so we have to prepare an EDID that works for all of these permit permutations and give a good result. On the other end, we talk to TVs or PC monitors or an HDMI switch or what AV receiver. So we need to parse the EDID inside those displays and do the right thing. So EDIDs are really important for us and we see a vast variety of uh, both good and bad EDIDs. Um, now, if everything was perfect, I wouldn't be here and I would be out of a job. Luckily, EDIDs have all problems and pitfalls and complications. In other words, that's job security. So, first a little quick introduction. So that, that gives a bit of a background. So why am I interested in this and why I'm giving this presentation? Hopefully everybody can take away something useful from this. Uh, first, explain the abbreviation, EDID, Extended Display Identification Data. It's basically, typically an EEPROM inside a display. It doesn't have to be an EEPROM, but it quite often is. That stores the display capabilities. And the source would read it out and determine what it can send. It has no, there's no point in sending 4K P60 to a VGA monitor. Uh, it's pretty old, uh, first version, 1994, probably based on earlier implementations that were unstandardized, so say 30 years. Originally VGA displays, later extended to DVI, then HDMI and display ports. And we had a meeting earlier this week in a meeting room that actually had a VGA uh, projector and it had an HDMI to VGA adapter and later someone needed the USB-C to HDMI adapter to talk to the chain. So you had DisplayPort, HDMI, VGA. So when you start dealing with those adapters, that's a whole... Uh, <laughs> let's say even with all this disinformation, you still can get really crazy things. How to read an EDID is specified in the Visa EDDC standard, Enhanced Display Data Channel. It is basically an I2C communication channel, even over display ports. It, it's, it's encoded over an AUX channel, but at the end in the display, it is still going over I2C. Uh, but you often see I2C and DDC uh, interchangeably used. These EEPROMs are specialized. It's not a standard EEPROM, although I think if it's uh, small enough, you could use it, but for bigger EDIDs, more than 256 bytes. You need a specialized EEPROM because you have some special, uh, you have an extra I2C address. Well, you don't, I'm, I'm not going into the details, I'm just saying these are typically custom EEPROMs. It as I said, doesn't have to be an EEPROM, quite often it's just a bit of memory in HDMI receiver that the display would write into at boot and that would then communicate over I2C. Uh, Current version that you will see is EDID 1.3. That's mandated by HDMI interfaces. I do not know why. I've never figured out why that is fixed at 1.3. If anybody knows, talk to me after the talk because I would like to know. Uh, the rest of the world typically uses uh, either 1.3 or 1.4. Display port interfaces typically are based on 1.4. The differences between the two are really minor. There's some flag, some bits have changed meaning, there are a few requirements in 1.3 that have been dropped in 1.4. It's not a 
is really small. Mostly the IDs consist of one to four blocks. Each block is 128 bytes. The first block is called the EDID base block, defined by Visa, the EDID standard. And there may be up to 255 extension blocks. Each extension block has an identifier and that maps to a standard that describes it. You typically only see CTA861 extension blocks uh, used, mandated by HDMI, and Display ID, which is defined by Visa, and that's what you typically see uh, for DisplayPort. The reality is that typically, so in practice, you can see different variations. I will go into that a little bit later. Um, so first, signaling, actually reading out how does that work. You connect a laptop to a display. I'm, I'm sticking with HDMI mostly because I know it best. And that is in practice what you will typically see in video conferencing equipment, most often HDMI. But most of these things are also true for DisplayPort. So you connect your laptop to the display. The laptop sends a 5 volt pin. Display sees that, hey, something gets connected. It will send back a hot plug detect pin uh, with a high voltage. The laptop detects that and it sees that it is high and that means that it can safely read the EDID. That is, there is an EDID and it is not being modified at the moment. It is a stable uh, contents. Then it reads the EDID over the DDC, aka I2C lines, parses it, figures out what is a safe video resolution to use, and then it can send the video to the display. Inside the display, I've uh, shown it here as an EEPROM. Uh, that is what the, where the EDID is coming from. Most cases, the display will power hot plug detect and the EEPROM by itself using its own power. Uh, there are some cases where it is the VIVE fault from the laptop that is actually powering the hot plug detect and the EEPROM. So that allows, you, allows a laptop to read the EDID even when the display is completely off. You don't see that all that often anymore, but uh, for example, we have been using an EDID emulator, which is just a little gadget, it's not a real display, it just emulates an EDID and that works in that way. Uh, I would say that about 98% of all the displays that we see power it themselves and there's a small percentage where it's using this uh, loop idea. Um, hot plug detect has its own issues. Uh, first of all, uh, the spec says, describes what it considers low and what it considers high. So 0 to 0 0.8 volts, then it's low, you shouldn't read an EDID. 2 to 5.3 volts and it's high, and then you can safely read an EDID. And of course, the obvious question is, what do you do with the remaining voltages? They don't say. Um, one problem with meeting rooms, you often have long HDMI cables. That means that the voltage can drop a lot. So uh, you usually, if you want to support those long cables, you put your thresholds in exactly that undefined area, because it's always better to get a picture where possible, then nothing. Interesting thing about long cables, they of manufacturers often take a lot of, make a lot of effort making sure that the video gets through, but these voltage lines, they don't pay enough attention. So you can have a long cable and if you just send a video, it's fine. But if you actually see, measure the voltages, then it might be that your laptop wouldn't even see the display because the voltage drops too much, even though it could carry the video, you don't see that there is something connected at all. Or you see it, but you can't read the EDID because the DDC lines have the same issue with voltages. So it's an interesting thing uh, if you buy long cables. Um, this can be an issue and it also depends on the laptop, the precise video source where this is put. The threshold itself, so long cables, um, not all that easy. Uh, another thing, if the hot plug detect pin goes low for more than 100 milliseconds, you are supposed to reread the EDID. It can be changed. Um, it's surprising to me that quite often this does not happen. 
uh, is either assumed to, you know, it's, it only reads the EDID at the first connection and doesn't expect it to change afterwards, or it has some debouncing algorithm that is set to too large. Um, uh, that's definitely something you need to take into account when you're writing, say, a DRM driver. Uh, displays often toggle the hotplot detects when they switch inputs or go from on to standby or vice versa. Uh, when you connect a cable or disconnect, you can get bin, pin bounce. So you see the hotplot detect toggling very quickly in a short time. So these are all things you need to take care of when you are writing software because these can all happen. So that's electrical, let's now go to the meat of the story. So assuming that electrically you actually were able to read the EDID and now you're starting to parse. I'm using an example EDID. It is based on a 5K monitor, but it's a Frankenstein EDID. So I removed some stuff that is not interesting and I added some things that are interesting. So you won't find this anywhere in an actual database, but 5K monitors are a very nice example of a lot of the issues that you will encounter. Um, so we start with the base block. All this is, by the way, output of an EDID decode utility. I will mention that at the end of the presentation. It parses an EDID and shows it in human readable form. Um, so it starts off very simple, EDID 1.3. Uh, vendor and product identification, I removed the guilty parties here. Actually not all that guilty, they were constrained by um, some of the issues relating to what they want to do. Uh, basic parameters and features. So first thing, maximum image size. So that is supposed to be the size of your physical panel in centimeters. First of all, it's a limitation of 255 centimeters. And yes, you get larger displays, and no, they can't store that in here, the exact size. Um, the other issue is that quite often vendors, you know, they have a whole series. Same, basically the same hardware, just panels in different sizes. And they don't bother to update the EDID between the different sizes. So you can't fully rely on this, it gives an indication only. Next up, color characteristics. Now that's a, we, we go straight into the deep here. Color character, characteristics, those are the colorimetry of the panel. So how does it represent red, green, and blue? And how, how exactly is the, what color space is it using? Um, PCs on the desktop, they normally default to sRGB, which is standard for color spaces. I'm not going, to the whole color space topic, that is the full presentation by itself. So you just have to believe me here. Um, and as long as the color characteristics stated here are the same as sRGB, then there is no problem. Everybody is in agreement. Problem occurs when it differs, because when you are transmitting RGB over HDMI, the lovely CTA861 standard, which is pretty big, has a big table and there there is a small footnote that tells you that when you're sending RGB over HDMI, you are supposed to use the colorimetry from this base block. However, only MacBooks do this. Everybody else just sends sRGB. So if you try to calibrate a display on a Mac compared to a Windows or a Linux machine, you will get different results. Um, and the, other the flip side on that is what does the display do? What does it expect? Does it expect to see the source using this specific, these specific color characteristics? Or does it expect it to send sRGB? And I have absolutely no idea. It's only this year when an amendment to CTA 861 was released where you could explicitly signal I'm sending sRGB or I'm sending default RGB using these default characteristics. Since it's so recent, nobody is using this yet, but I'm hoping that it will pick up because it's really annoying that it is undefined. Um, one thing I forgot to mention at the start, I am on behalf of Cisco, part of the CTA 861 workgroup. 
for the past five years and I've been trying to improve the standard. Um, and actually this is one of the things I managed to get in. Also, by the way, one of the changes that went quickest, everybody just agreed, hey, yeah, <laughs> this is undefined, this is a mess, let's fix it. So, next up in the EDID, established timings. This is a bit of archaeology. Remember, 1994, um, this is one of the first things that were defined, so you get lovely resolutions like 640 by 400. And, you know. um, yes, you can use it, but this is old stuff. Um, slightly later in time, standard timings. Hey, now we go up to some more decent resolutions, beginning to look like something. And then you get detailed timing descriptors. Now it becomes really interesting. These are meets the, 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 the normal stuff that people use. Usually the first detailed timing descriptor should match your preferred resolution and your native resolution as well. Notice, however, this is a 5K display. That timing is not 5K. Why is that? Because when this was designed, uh, they could not imagine a 5K display. So the maximum width and height is 4095. So the best you can do as an EDID writer is to have at least something with the same aspect ratio that comes closest. And that's what they did. No fault of the EDID is just a limitation of these old base blocks. Notice that the detailed timing descriptor also has uh, an, an image size, physical size. The chances that that matches the image size earlier in the base block is close to zero. Uh, if there is an image size in the beginning, then ignore this. If there is no image size in the beginning, it's undefined, then you can use this, but you know, be careful. Um, you see here it says detailed timing descriptors, but there is only one, and after that you get other things. So detailed timing descriptors is, there are four in the base EDID, but usually you will see only one or two being used as video timings. And the others are, uh, you, you, it's the, this space is abused to represent other information about the display. So you have one uh, display range limits, which gives you the minimum and maximum vertical and horizontal refresh rates and a maximum pixel clock. Um, so there can be many timings defined in an EDID, and if you actually go through them all and figure out what the minimum and maximum ranges are, and you match that with this, this is usually wrong. So there are always almost always is one or more timings that are, have lower refresh rates or higher refresh rates. Unless you have some software to check this, it's very hard to do this manually. There's product name, product serial number, and then the number of extension blocks that follow. So that was the base EDID. Now for this 5K uh, monitor, the next one coming up is block one. It's called a block map extension. No, it's block map extension block, terrible name. Basically an index in the extension blocks that follow. Now, there are only four blocks, so you have just two indices. That means that you've wasted about 120 bytes of precious EEPROM memory on a pretty useless extension block. You could have just read the whole EDID and look at the type of each extension block and figure it out. Um, so this comes from the EDID 1.3 standard that mandates this. If you have more than two blocks, you need the second block needs to be this specific extension block. Remember that HDMI requires 1.3. So if you want to have a valid EDID for an HDMI interface with more than two blocks, you are forced to put this into block one, the stacked second block since the beginning. It's very wasteful, but because HDMI is stuck at 1.3, that's the only way you could do it. 
Um, nice complication, some of the older transmitter hardware might read only two blocks of an EDID. So they would get the base block and then this useless extension block and not be able to see the following blocks. Now to be honest, it's pretty rare these days, but it, it is something to keep into account when you write an EDID that not all hardware is able to read your full EDID. So if it just reads the first block, then they will make different decisions to one that's more modern and can read your whole EDID. So put at least some decent values into your first block. Um, now HDMI clearly thought that this was silly as well. So I think it was last year they came out with an amendment that added a special data block to the CTA extension block. And if that's present, then you could override the number of extension blocks. So the first base block would still say, I have only one extension block. Then it would read the CTA extension block, and that would say, no, you don't have one extension block, you have two extension blocks. Ignore the first one. Um, yeah, you're all laughing, and that might be why I haven't seen this in any EDID yet. It's, um, so when, when, by the way, when this EDID was made, this didn't exist yet. And I'm not aware, I wonder if there are any implementations at the moment that would actually parse this. Um, so we go to the CTA861 extension block. Uh, notice here, so there's a video data block with all the various resolutions that are being supported. CTA defines video identification codes basically byte values, every byte has a certain meaning. Um, but above that you see uh, native detailed modes one. That means that the first DTD in the EDID is supposed to be the, D the native resolution. Now remember the first DTD didn't match the 5K resolution. So this would indicate that 3840 by 1080 is the native resolution. Clearly it isn't. For the first fig, it also sets a native bit. So now you have two native resolutions that conflict, and neither of them actually match the actual native resolution. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, then you get some audio information. Hey, there's two speakers, left, right, lovely. Some colorimetry, what other color spaces does it support? And then you get the video capability data block. That has a very important one, RGB quantization, selectable. Uh, this is, a, I said this is a Frankenstein EDID. The original didn't have this. I added this for illustrative purposes. So RGB quantization is the bane of my life. Um, when you're sending red, green, blue out as a source, you have two ways of doing it. The first one is that zero is black and 255 is full brightness, full range. The other is, 16 is black, 235 is full brightness, limited range. Consumer electronics equipment, basically everything relating to TV, uses limited range. It goes all the way back to the old CRTs and original TVs, long, long, horrible history. PCs didn't care about that, we can do full range from the start. So of course you have more levels, so less bending, it's a good thing, full range in my view. But um, consumer electronics is limited to, well, limited range. So when you're sending some, so the prob as long as consumer electronics is completely separate from IT world, then there's no problem. But these days, you know, every laptop has an HDMI output, TVs can use it IT equipment as input and Blu-ray as an input. So the worlds have collided. And now you have a problem. CTA 861 standard says, okay, if you're sending a video timing, so consumer electronics timing, so 720p, 1080p, 4K, all the things you get with when you put in a Blu-ray disc, basically, then it's limited range by default. If you get an IT timing, uh, 1920 by 1200, those types of things, then it's full range. Um, the chances of anybody, so both source and sync, doing all the right things based on the defaults are pretty remote, 50-50 at best. Uh, and it gets even worse when you add all sorts of adapters in between. P 
PC monitors tend to behave differently from TVs. They tend to uh, assume full range, TVs assume limited range. Different graphics drivers, even on different OSs, do make different decisions. So it's horrible, basically. I'm pretty sure this is wrong, by the way. I haven't tested it yet, but it's, I give it an 80% chance that this will display the colors, will assume uh, most likely full range, while my laptop is sending limited range. Uh, so I'm not the only one who thought that. In, in CTA 861 version H, syncs are required to set the selectable RGB bits. That means that they accept that the source can explicitly signal whether it's full range or limited range. They can parse that. And if you are a source, and you detect that the EDID supports this, you really should explicitly signal this. In fact, the recommendation is to always explicitly signal this. Because what can go wrong? It at least will at least be as wrong as it already was, and with luck, it's actually better. So, RGB quantization. I could make a whole presentation about this, but I'll, I'll keep it at that. So, next up, you have an Vendor-specific data block, this is defined by HDMI. Specification uh, has a bunch of information and it has then a weird list of HDMI VIX. Remember CTA uh, defines a number of video identification codes. Uh, when the first 4K displays came out and HDMI wanted to support it, the CTA standard didn't have corresponding VIX. Now, apparently, instead of talking to the CTA guys and saying, hey, we need this, uh, now nah, we make our own. So, that's what they did. Uh, there are only four, four VIX that they defined. Um, these are basically 4K, P30, 25 and 24. Um, let me, yeah, I'll come, yes. An interesting thing here, so that's going back to the previous page. If I signal uh, so one of those HDMI VIX, what is the default RGB quantization range? They didn't define it. You go through the whole spec and they say nothing about RGB quantization range. Um, later on, CTA added proper VIX for these timings, and still later the HDMI specification said, yes, they are interchangeable. So then it becomes clear, since these are CE timings, consumer electronics timings, the default is limited range. In the meantime, there were lots of drivers that assumed full range. So actually, I'm pretty sure that the Intel driver started out with full range and later had to switch to limited range. It's all because they didn't define it and we had major problems figuring out what to do in our own products with this. Um, so these additional HDMI vendor-specific blocks, they indicate that you have an HDMI interface. But this gets tricky when you have HDMI to display port adapters or the other way around. It's not clear at all whether they are supposed to remove these blocks or add these blocks. Um, uh, I find the specifications for such adapters uh, mostly non-existent and I think every interface standard just points to the other one, figure it out and nothing actually happens for this. Um, for once, this is the remainder of this extension block. Uh, there's really nothing, there's nothing special here for once. Some HDR information, some more detailed timings and that's it. Now we get to the last uh, extension block and it's hey 5k amazing so the only extension block that can actually represent 5k that is a display ID extension block so that is why this particular display has four blocks in total the base block and they're forced to use the block map then the CDA and then the display ID block just to tell everybody that, hey, I support 5K. Notice though that it says preferred, but it still says nothing about that this is the native resolution. 
They could have done that. Display ID has support for that, but for some reason it wasn't added here. So even though you can figure out from this EDID that it supports this, it still doesn't say that it is the native resolution. Um, now, a bit related to those adapters, the same thing happens when you mix CTA and display ID. Who has priority? What should you do when there are conflicts? Not defined. I try to bring it up. No, let, let, let me. It's not defined. Um, there are several reasons why you might want to use both, even on the display port interface. Uh, CTA is very handy. You can, re you can represent lots of uh, video timings in a quite concise manner. It is very well understood. You might be, uh, have a display with both HDMI and DisplayPort inputs. And you want to keep the EDIDs as similar as possible, so you want to reuse that information. Um, if you do, make sure that there are no conflicts between the two. If they're all saying the same thing, then it will work out well. <coughs> if you get conflicts, then well, what do you do? Um, to support these 5K displays, we had to do quite tricky things in our parsers to figure out whether it's, you know, you want to make sure that it's not a broken EDID. You want to make sure, yes, it is really a good EDID, and yes, this is really a valid resolution that we want to support. So I think this EDID gave a lot of interesting um, has a lot of interesting issues. Let's now go to how do you um, how do you parse them and check them. So I maintain an EDID decode utility. Uh, I took over. It, it goes all the way back to 2006. Was maintained by Adam Jackson. Was part of the X11. Uh, one of the X11 utilities included with that. Uh, by 2017, it had become quite outdated and we wanted to have a really good parser that we could use and also check EDIDs. It had already some conformity checks, but was by no means, was very limited. So I took over mainta maintenance in 2018 and have been adding support for all the latest features and, and things and improving the conformity checks. Um, and it's not pretty good. I won't say it's perfect. Uh, especially on the conformity checks, there are still some things that can be improved, but you know, there are so many standards and a lot of these requirements are hidden in, in small print. But if you want to check an EDID and see how well it is implemented, this is a pretty good utility. There's also a web page, this will be updated daily with the latest version of EDID decode. You can just drag in an EDID and it will parse it and give the results. Um, useful options for this EDID decode utility, minus C, to the checking. At the end you will see warnings, failures, uh, occasionally it's a pass. Minus N will show the native resolutions if according to the rules and the ID, EDID. Minus P will show the preferred timings, based again on the rules. Uh, now you have noticed in the previous Outputs of this utility that you know all these timings come with that they're split out in all the parameters. So this utility knows about all these timings, knows the exact precise video timings that they represent. Uh, that means that it was very easy to also add some options to where you could just um, let it do the calculation. I want a CVT timing with a certain resolution put in the parameters and the, this, the, the, the program will give you the exact timing. Uh, you may remember, so those that may have used it, X11 also provides CVT utility, and the GTF utility, to do the calculations. Uh, I've discovered that those are wrong in some cases. This is all based on the actual standards. Uh, it also has even the very latest um, uh, timings, OVT, optimized video timings, that was introduced in CTA 861.6. So this is completely up to date as far as I know it. 
So what will happen if you run this and check the preferred video timings for that 5K monitor? So if you just parse block zero, you get that resolution. You remember that was the first detailed timing. So that's wrong. If you parse uh, block zero in the CTA block, you get uh, that the, the first DTD again and the first VIC with 1080p. Again, no 5K. Only when you parse block zero in the display ID block, then you will get 5K. So it depends on the parser what it understands and what it's doing, what the result is that you get. If you do the same for figuring out the native resolution, then it's not there at all. As I mentioned before, it's just missing. Um, CTA added, however, support to improve handling preferred resolutions and native resolutions. Native resolutions are very new, came out in February this year. Preferred resolutions has been there a bit earlier. It also added lots of support. So this is a test EDID that I just manually crafted, which basically has support for all the different ways you can uh, implement timings. And as you can see, it's CTA now supports display IT timings as well. You can use them in there. And those can go up to 5K. Um, it has optimized video timings that they have a resolution ID stating what the resolution is and then they have they can support various refresh rates and from there timings follow. This is all part of the CTA standards, you can read up on it. Uh, there's a video format preference data block where you can list your preferred resolutions in order. There are basically references to timings you defined before. And finally, there is a native video resolution data block that says which timing represents the native resolution. And if you do the same thing with EDID decodes for this one, then you will actually get the right information. So if you parse it with a CTA parser that understands the native video resolution data block, you will get the proper native resolution and that is what you want. But this is also new that before this is, uh, before this is all uh, filtered through to actual drivers that parse this and display manufacturers that implement this, we are probably several years further. Resources. Uh, EDID Decodes repository, it's part of the linuxtv.org where we keep all the media subsystem uh, tree and utilities. The EDID, EDDC and Display ID standards are freely available from Visa. CTA 861 standard is freely available from the CTA.tech website. I have an email. And that's it about EDID. Nicely on time. And I have a few minutes for questions. You are close by. My first one. I noticed uh, on one of the slides there was core 12 bit or 14 bit color depth defined for 5K monitor, uh, what is it about? So how about fitting it into 8 bits? Uh, that's, uh, let me see. Oh yeah, this one, supports 12 bits, component deep color, or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's, that's deep color, and uh, I haven't talked about this at all, but that means in effectively that the, the, um, the bandwidth, the frequency will go up in order to accommodate that. So if you look at here the, the so the maximum TMDS character rate at the bottom says section of megahertz and that is the number of pixels that you pass through, it's not the actual frequency. So if you go with higher bit depth the actual frequency will go up as well. But the number of pixels that you transfer remains the same. Uh, and you have to, of course, the cable has to support that. So if the cable doesn't support it. So when you're using a, an HDMI to display for an adapter, for example, how does, um, is the ADI need to pass through normally from the, uh, kind of red edges, I guess, or is it? Uh, <laughs> you don't know. So a, a properly implemented adapter. So the display is a display port and 
you are sending it through HDMI, so HDMI to DisplayPort converter. So the adapter is supposed to add these HDMI vendor-specific data blocks. Whether it does, you don't know. The good ones will, the bad ones won't. Oh, limited range, yes. Um, it's, it started out in the analog world. So you never had precise black and white levels. It was just, you know, waveform. And they just said this voltage is black and this voltage is white. But you, it, because it's analog, you would get these overshoots. So when you digitize this, you might want to preserve those overshoots. So that's why you have this extra headroom. Uh, there are also interfaces. Um, SDI, um, but no, some serial ports for variations to transfer video that are actually using bytes in the 0, 1, 2, 5, 4, 2, 5, 5 range to signal metadata. So there too you want to stick to limited range. This is all broadcast TV stuff. But hey, that was the world until for many, many years. So that's all reflected here. Uh, come to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. Yes, but it's a yes, but answer. Okay, thank you. Yes, too late. I have to stop. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much.